Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, it's great to see everyone, and thank you, Mike and Larissa, for some amazing, inspirational speaks to start us off the day. So our topic today, how open-minded leadership encourages growth, diversity, and innovation. And joining me on the panel, we have Amy Buchanan. Amy, the Group M CEO and MFA Board Director. And I'm Mark, I'm from UM Senior Client Director. So I'd love to start by asking everyone just a simple question. So what have we all learned today? Mike, can we start with you, please? <laughs> Put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love, I'm lucky in that I, I listened to Narissa speak last week and when we did this in Melbourne as well. And uh, I think, again, hear, hearing the same thing twice um, with variation, where are you, Narissa? Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is is fantastic because you hear different things and you kind of learn different things. But I think for me it was a, you know, I, I was kind of reflecting on things that I actually have to do today and, and the idea about actively listening and really listening and seeing the person, uh, you know, before the identity um, just really resonated for me. I found that really great. Fantastic. Thank you. Amy? I just love the perspective piece. I'm still trying to figure out what happened from here to here. <laughs> but I think just so powerful demonstration of you think something is one way and a slightly different perspective on it gives you a whole different angle. So I found that incredibly powerful. Amazing. Marissa? Um, I think for me, would, um, similarly, you know, hearing Mike speak again, different things land. And I think for me, it's the key takeouts on what can we do when we find ourselves in those situations around you know, checking our own biases and the different forms of bias, but also what can we do, you know, step back, recheck it, get another opinion in, and how can we then put that into different practices that we leave here with? So for me, it's definitely looking at the different ways that we can first tackle our own bias, you know, being aware of it, that it exists, but then what can we do about it? Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Lots of great tips and tricks. So thank you very mm. much, both of you, for your speaks this morning. Okay, let's jump into the questions. So thank you for the MFA 5 Plus committee who've sent through the questions today. We've bucketed them into three themes. So the first one around resistance, the second one around experience, and the third one around improve. Hoping we're gonna have some time for some questions at the end, so keep your thinking caps on. Any questions, please pop your hand up and we'll hopefully be able to give away a copy of Narissa's book, Growing Through. Okay, so let's start with the first bucket around resistance. So wanting to be an open-minded leader is one thing, but many leaders are bound by challenges. Have you pitched a never-before-done never idea to a C-suite level, and how did you manage the resistance? An example, you know, oh, no, that's a full-time role. We could never offer that as part-time role. We couldn't sort of do that. It's never been done. Any thoughts, Marissa? Yeah, it's a great, great question because I think, you know, we've just spoken about being open-minded and doing things differently, but you're right. When we go into actually doing it, we're met with you know, well, we've always done it this way, or how do we pitch something? And what I found in terms of uh, pitching new ideas and, and resistance around that, managing that, is talking to the why. Talking to the why. You know, Simon Sinek says, start with why. But I find that so important because often people don't say no because they want to say no, or they want to, you know, oppose the idea. They say no sometimes because they don't understand, or they haven't had that different perspective. So we, we can approach something by explaining the why around it. I think there's a lot more chance in getting the buy-in when someone understands that it, you know, it's not just stats, there's a story attached to it. And how can we reflect that story and that narrative into that why to then change, you know, the, the not always like how we do it, but to actually change and get a different outcome to what we went into that meeting with. Yeah. Mike, anything? Uh, yeah, I, I can think of, of one which is uh, a media-related example, actually, where we were pitching, when I was working at DDB a number of years ago, we were pitching for the uh, the Daily Telegraph um, at the time, and who said they needed a new advertising campaign. Sales were going down, and we did some research, and we figured out the reason why the, the sales were going down, and you know, we had this idea and this kind of approach that we were going uh, to back to the Daily Telegraph. And the, the editor at the time was a, a guy called Col Allen, who might be just thinking, you know, maybe Mark uh, or people of experience might, uh, might, might know uh, Col. Um, but he was a ferocious and very, very kind of scary person. And this idea that we had, we had people saying to us, oh, you're going to present that to Col? You know, because we were saying, actually, the answer is to your challenge is not advertising. 
It's how you need to change your product. That's why not people are not buying the paper. So you are going to tell the editor of the Daily Telegraph to change the Daily Telegraph. It's a big thing to do. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we did. And uh, so people were just good luck. You know, but the approach that we took was, uh, here is the reason why you are losing sales. You, the people that are not reading the paper so much anymore are interested in these things and these things, and editorially, you are not speaking to them, so you need to build that in, into your paper. People are interested in financial stuff, IT stuff, and so on. And he was like, um, okay, that makes sense. It's just like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was like, we were all scared. How's he going to react? And uh, actually, it was just about building an argument. The why, mm. you know, and, you know, that, that overcome, there was no resistance when you actually present things the right way and respectfully with data and evidence. Yeah, wonderful. So our industry is known for hiring people that are like us. We are a homogenous industry. So how can we learn to be more open-minded when hiring and when clients are reluctant for a new type of thinking? Amy? Yeah, great question. I think if one thing COVID taught, taught me personally is that the, you know, we went through a period where there wasn't a lot of ability to people pay rises to move people internally. And one of the things we did quite quickly was open up the interviewing process. I think what we're all probably a bit guilty of is we grow these people up in our team and we want them to keep moving in our team, but sometimes they're not the best person for that next role. Mm -hmm. um, the number one thing I'd say on this is uh, remove any direct uh, direct appointments. I think that's the biggest kind of sin around our industry is we all tend to know each other. Yeah. It's really easy to ring your mate and go, come work for me. Mm. Um, but with that, you're just genuine, genuinely hiring people who are similar to you. So yeah, I think remove the direct appointments, move to a panel based. I think what we're trying to do on all of our major hires is have multiple people from different um, backgrounds go through the interview process. Uh, and we make a decision based on a scorecard with a diverse group of people that we're interviewing. And that's shifted and in some ways taken out the, um, the ability for us to give back feedback that's quite tangible. So you see someone present a solution in terms of why they're right for the job. I think you're able to go, here are the three reasons why we think they are. And it's, it, it ladders to something other than a quite shallow interview piece, which you tend to just see what you want to see and hear what you want to hear. So I think open up the interview process in terms of who's hiring and remove direct appointments would be the, the two things that I think will shift that for us. Yeah, great. Cool. So let's jump to our second bucket now around experience. So often what happens when someone wants to try something new, the individual may say, oh, we've already tried that and it didn't work. We were open-minded and it isn't working, worth trying again. So in this case, is it worth being open-minded at all, Amy? Yeah, look, I, I think timing is a big part of this. And I was thinking about this last night over the history of sort of all the things that we've suggested. I mean, I remember writing a flexible working policy four years ago and presenting it and everyone going, really, we're going to let people work at home two days a week? <laughs> That'll never work. Um, or I worked on Optus for, you know, 10 years of my career and I remember them saying, we're going to do music for Christmas and us being like, okay, the handsets were so old, the network was so bad, it would take half an hour for a song to stream. It was a disaster, but fast forward two or three years and, and music was absolutely where things were at. So I think just because it didn't work once, it's important to understand why it didn't work and to dig into that. Um, but I think context, timing, what has shifted is a big part around whether things will be a success that maybe weren't in the past. Yeah, perfect. Any builds on that, Marissa? Any sort of opportunities? Yeah, I think, you know, similar to what you were saying, I think we have to be willing, you know, it's the common thing, well, you've tried once, do we try again? It's like, well, try, try again, right? <laughs> but it's, do we try the same thing again or do we try something different? And if it didn't work, why didn't it work? what could we tweak? And we don't have to change it completely, but let's tweak something to then make it work. Um, so I would say that don't let the first time you try something be the last time that you try it. Yeah, I love that. Definitely try, try again. There's always one way to sort of push yourself further and, and sort of really get to that next level and really sort of uncover something more. All right, let's jump to our third buckle around improve. So Mike, you spoke before about some great tips and tricks. I'm sure I saw a lot of people really writing down those, <laughs> those five things to take away from today. So thank you for those. Um, are there any other exercises to help us retrain our brains to be more open-minded? Mm, that's a, 
I, there are so many ways to do that, really, and I, I think there are uh, one of the ways that we find particularly useful, again, in, in, in thinking through behavioural science to, to get to answers for, for things, is to, this is quite easy to do, actually, is to access a list of you know, cognitive biases and behavioural biases, and there's hundreds of them. Mm. Um, but when you're thinking about a particular behaviour that you're looking to change or, or create, you know, it, it, it can be at times as easy and, and, and no more complicated than just kind of going through a list of behavioural science biases saying, OK, um, you know, I, I'm, I want more people to sign up for a you know, particular experience or whatever it is. And you just go, oh, I wonder how social norms might be in operation. Mm. I wonder how availability bias might be in operation. I wonder how loss aversion might be in operation. And so on and so on and so on. And, and you can simply use those biases to generate an idea that will be more behaviorally effective because it comes from a a proven principle. Mm. So you can use scientific concepts as brainstorming platforms that will get you to an idea that otherwise you wouldn't have thought of. Because if you're just solving your problem in your regular channeled way, you, you just won't think about social norms or all of the other. I'll just use that as one example. But that to me is, is something I'd recommend for everyone, it's easy. You know, you don't have to pay anything for it. You get these things online, and you just think through. I wonder how that could be an operation. I wonder how I could use it. Yeah, perfect. Marissa, any tips and tricks? Yeah, in terms of, um, look, I think it's really important to be aware, firstly, that these things exist. Because I think if we go into something and saying, well, I don't have any biases, mm. I think that in itself is a bias. Mm. Totally. Like, so you know, we have to be aware that this exists, and then think about. How do I do things differently? And think about, well, what can I take as a learning from each one? Because sometimes we'll approach something and it's not going to work or we're going to get things wrong. And it's about being willing to go, okay, I might get things wrong, but at least I'm trying. And going, how else can I do this differently? And then taking learnings from each one into the next to build onto it and therefore keep growing. And I think that's really important that we don't just stop, but we keep doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And then... Any ways that we can stop around prejudices? So, Amy, maybe in sort of a hiring point of view, you know, how could we sort of take that out of the equation and stop our thinking around, oh, that person's not right, they're too old, they're too inexperienced? Is there any ways we can sort of get around that or think a little bit differently in that moment? I mean, there's lot, there's lots written about this, you know, taking people's names and, and a lot of their identity off CVs is, mm. is an obvious one. I personally find the quickest way to get to a slightly different outcome is to have more people involved in that process and not just the person that they'll be reporting into because mm. that often ends up a very similar outcome. Um, yeah, so for me it's how do you bring more people into that process, how do you ensure that that panel that is interviewing is diverse yeah. and that you're, you're bringing diversity into the conversation. I think what often happens is you want a more diverse outcome but they're the same people going through the process that, that are making the decisions. and. And you speak to any diversity and inclusion expert who's who in any big corporate and will say the number one reason that diversity is not changing is direct appointments, lack of a panel, lack of a process, yeah. and and just taking some of that subjectivity out of the room. I mean, it, when you're literally looking at a scorecard across six people from different backgrounds, it leads to quite diverse debate. Mm -hmm. um, and think, I think the other thing is, you know, making sure that you've got people who aren't necessarily always the most senior people. Like, who's, who's, who's the voice of the floor that's part of that, even in a senior hire? Because you want to make sure that whilst you bring diversity, that there's also a fit um, and it's complementary so that they do belong. And so it does work yeah. from a... Yeah, continuity point of view. So that would be my two cents, but I'm not as smart as Mike. So. What do you <laughs> I don't have all the processes. Well, I, I think I, so this is group think and happy talk now. And I'm You're going to disagree. Agreeing. Disagree. Uh, I get a red card. <laughs> no, I, 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 I actually learned quite a bit from, from what Amy was saying, but we, we have, uh, we, we've completely changed our recruitment process uh, in the last year. And before that, we were reliant, I think, on direct appointments, as you were saying, yeah. you know, which were often fed through to us by headhunters. Mm -hmm. And we, we figured out at the end of last year, you know, we'd, we'd spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in 
uh, recruitment fees based on commissions to, to headhunters, and for a fraction of that now, we, we engage an, H, an HR consultant to, uh, and we looked at our competencies across the, the business, we created new job descriptions, we identified our structure, what we were recruiting for, we recruited through the HR comp uh, company and uh, set up panel interviews. So three of us now with a set of questions and a scorecard interview each person for you know half an hour to an hour and we discuss immediately afterwards and we make a decision that quickly and it changes the the bias from you know hey i saw someone who's really good amy can you, can you see this person too i really like them you know so you're kind of you're now under pressure from me because i really like this person you know and so it, it, it saves time it, i think it increases diversity and i think it's yeah. a, for us, it's increased the quality of, uh, of our, our, the people that, that we're bringing in. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Any questions from the floor? We'd love to hear from everyone, if anyone's been thinking away. Something they'd love to ask our panel up here. Down the front. Yeah. Hi, uh, Emma from Initiative. That's all been really, really useful. I had a question for Mike. Uh, around the optimism bias, I think we all know that mental health is becoming increasingly challenging, especially through COVID, um, and there's just so much negativity and things happening in the world. Have you found or do you see that that optimism bias is kind of changing with all of this negativity and, and challenges around mental health? Mm. Gosh, I, I th that, that's a, a fascinating question. And... Uh, you know, reflecting on, our, I think, our own experience rather than anything I've necessarily kind of uh, read or any science that I'm aware of about this. I think, uh, I think that w we are all innately, most of us are innately hardwired to be optimistic. And in fact, it's people who are, you know, suffer from clinical depression, you know, are not. You know, they, they sort of are more likely in a way to see the world as it, as it really is. I think... It, you know, we, we know that mental health issues, depression and things like that have been on the increase. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty inclined to say, th th you know, the, the, the kind of the point in your question is, is correct, that I think that there is a, a lesser degree of general optimism at the moment. As it pertains to specific projects and tasks and timelines and those sorts of, you know, those details of everyday work, I'm inclined to think that optimism remains the same way, you know, and I, I distinguish between, in a sense, general optimism here with, you know, a more specific optimism in relation to activities and tasks. But I, I also I would agree with your kind of premise, I think. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Middle here. Diana King. Uh, hi, Kingy from uh, Meta. Um, Amy, I, I've, I found today's presentation fantastic. I'm, I'm super. Um, Super pumped to apply them at work. We at Meta have a lot of these kind of um, D and I and unconscious bias training, and, I, and I've been there for about eight years. I'm really interested about the kind of contradictions we heard today. Like, I'm learning about my unconscious biases, and how do I understand my unconscious biases? My my question is, how do we ensure that the dynamic nature of our industry and the dynamic nature of our jobs and our teams and team dynamics are maintained and that we can use our gut feels while understanding that we have biases and unconscious biases. I think that's a real contradiction I, I find fascinating and I'd love to um, explore more. The great question. It's what was running through my head um, when you were talking about the list. I was like, half of the decisions we make are made in like seconds. Um, and I think that's okay for a lot of the decisions that we're making. I think it's the moment you go, and I, I had one last week um, around the passing of the Queen, and I had someone ring me and say, you need to send an all staff email. And I said, like, do I? And our global CEO had already sent one. I was kind of going, I feel uncomfortable with this, but she was pressuring me. Um, and I literally said, let me think on this for a couple of hours. Um, it wasn't a decision I needed to make instantly. And I think it's understanding that lens of 
is this something that is is going to compromise or put risk into the people or the business if I decide now? Or is it something that I can be willing to let settle and sit with me for a little while? And I did. I made three or four phone calls to quite a diverse group of people. What are your thoughts? Do you think this is necessary? Um, and what is the risk in this and what is the upside of doing it? And landed on, I'm not comfortable with it, so it's probably not the right thing to do. But it, it, I think it's just understanding where you can give yourself space. Um, it's probably my biggest learning as a leader is that you don't, not every decision is needed instantly and there are some that are, but there are a lot that aren't. And sometimes sleeping on things for 24 hours gives you a very different lens when you're not, and it also takes the heat out of the discussion. I, th I had one last week where it got quite crunchy um, <laughs> and I was sort of going, oh God, I've walked into a bit of a um, heated debate and the meeting finished, people had to leave, which sometimes is a grace. Um, <laughs> not that they had to leave, but that we all got time to cool down, let everyone go off, uh, came back to it 24 hours later and all of the anger and heat was out of the room and it was a very sensible debate. You know, five years ago, I would have pushed that to get to an outcome. Um, I think my number one learning is let things settle. Sometimes they work themselves out and sometimes you get clarity. So I, I, I hear you though, like I was sitting there going, the list, I wouldn't even get to Google to find the list. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's knowing when you have that, that, that pace and mindset. One more over here. Hey, I'm Lauren from Mindshare. Uh, Amy actually kind of touched on this a little bit, but Narissa, you were talking about leading being, you know, taking that next step, even when you don't know where it is. Um, where do you find that fortitude within yourself to take that next step? But also, given that you are leading on behalf of others as well and for them, how do you take that time to also look after yourself when you're doing scary things like that all the time? Great, great question, great question. So I think when, when we're thinking about doing, you know, that taking that step or doing that, that thing that hasn't been done before, we often think about confidence. And we think, I have to have all the confidence I need to do this. But I'm going to say it comes down to courage before confidence. And courage isn't like the loudest voice saying, you know, you need to do this or make this big thing. It's often just saying, try again. You know, take one more step. Try, like, have a different conversation. And it's coming down to that. And the more we do it, like the first time is going to be scary. Like the first time I spoke to a group of people like you, I was like, I don't want to get up on stage. But, you know, similar to that, the more things you do, the easier it's going to become. So I would encourage you to, to keep taking that first step because the first step is going to become the second and the third and the fourth that you take. Um, going back to, you know, what do we do for ourselves? I think it's really, really important to take time out, especially given everything that's going on not just in our lives, but around the world, is take time to put joy back into your life. Find ways in your day to do things that fill your cup, because a lot of stuff that we're doing is, is giving out. And we're trying to be there for people, for our friends, families, colleagues, the industry, everyone. And I think it's really important to take time out. And what I've done is I have a list of things that I can do in a minute, in five minutes, in 15, 20, an hour, two hours. So often the thing is when it comes to taking time out for ourselves, we think, I don't have any time. You know, but if you have that list of going, sometimes it might be just putting on a, a song that you like and having a bit of a dance. Sometimes it might be just getting up and stretching or going out for a bit of a walk that goes, okay, I can you know, disconnect from this stuff, put some joy back into my life and go back into it. So I would encourage you to do that, is find the joy in your life and make sure you put it in. Cool. All right. I'd love to start. Oh, sorry, fine. finish with a start. Let's start again. Going again. <laughs> we can do it all One more time. <laughs> that wasn't satisfactory. <laughs> We'd like to start again. Yeah. <laughs> so a final question for everyone. If there's one tip you could give to every leader in the room to leave an action today, what would it be? Mike? I, I'm, I'm going to go back to that question about gut feel, though, because I... You know, Daniel Kahneman says... My answer wasn't good enough. <laughs> no, I, th I think, it, you know, I, I'd like to red team that. But, um, I, I, Daniel Kahneman says, you know, that, that really you should, you should put off decisions based on gut feel for as long as you possibly can. He thinks that, you know, gut feel is, is, is the biggest enemy that, that we have in, in many ways. 
So to, to me, it's kind of, it depends what we mean by gut feel. Is it uh, a decision based on being experienced? You know, is that what gut feel means? Or is it just a first decision of any kind? I, some people's gut feel is, probably has more value than others. But uh, I, I think for me, it's that idea of, of postponing, if you can, you know, to, to sort of cool the situation down, to allow, you know, in behavioral science terms, <coughs> system two, reflective thought to come in a little bit more than system one immediate kind of impulsive thought yeah. is advisable where you can. Anecdote around that, Barack Obama, Obama was given all of the information about the location of uh, um, Osama bin Laden. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, we, we know where he is. You know, do we, do we sort of order the, the assassination, whatever it was? And he said, you know what, <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm going to sleep on it and we'll make the decision in the morning. Yeah. So that's what he did. And, you know, so, so I, I think that, that for me is, is, is try and postpone that, that, that gut feel, instinctive initial decision. Fantastic. Amy? No, I love the see people beyond the identity. I mm. think it's probably the hardest one to do because we're all, we all see each other as how we come into that room. But, yeah, I think seeing the person first is probably the, the one that I'll be taking away. Hmm. Think about, like, if I was to think about one action to leave you with or when you walk out, I would talk about accountability. Because I think we all go to these sessions and you have them you know, a few times a year and you learn things and you listen to things and then you leave and then we go back to doing things sometimes the way we did it before. So I'm going to say, as you walk out from here today, find someone in this room that is going to hold you accountable in those situations and make, have an accountability partner and make a commitment to take a different action. Think, what action am I going to take after I've learned everything that I've done today and I'm walking out from here? And then when it gets busy, when you get, find yourself in those situations where you're going to make those same decisions, feel free to call up that person and go, hold me accountable. So, yeah, I'll leave you with that. Amazing. Lots of tips, tricks, innovation. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Narissa. Thank you for being thank here you. today. And thank you to everyone. Thanks.